Well, thank you, Valerio. Can you? Is this on? Can you hear me back there? Is the, the mic on? OK. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here today and all the time, because as you know, I'm from here. And uh, it's, it's, it's even nicer to give a talk in front of uh, you know, colleagues and friends. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, I have to say, because uh, we're a big center and diverse with the diverse research interests. So I hope I won't bore half of you or I won't confuse the other half. I'll do my best. Um, so as, as Valerio said, uh, Mindin is, uh, this is kind of the series of um, PI colloquia for the 10 year of CQT. And more or less, this work will be kind of, uh, this talk will be a review of our group the last 10 years with a highlight towards the end on a very recent work uh, with uh, some, some guys in Google, the, the German tennis group. So, um, so stay to the point. The title sounds very uh, ambitious, condensed matter and quantum optics. A disclaimer, first of all, is I'm not a condensed matter physicist. So if there are condensed matter people in the audience, please be nice. Uh, uh, I really done quantum optics most of the time, but we want to pretend or we want to say or we want to claim, you can take it as you want, that the two disciplines can actually uh, merge. Uh, the talk has kind of four chapters, kind of like, like a fairy tale you want to see it or, or a story. The first chapter is about classical versus quantum simulators. So I will uh, try to um, briefly review what quantum simulation is. Uh, this picture probably is in every single um, physics talk, more or less, with Feynman. And, and his famous quote, one of, one of many famous quotes that Feynman made, is that nature is not classical. I mean, I guess if you talk to CQT now, it's kind of an obvious statement, but uh, 40 years ago, it was not very obvious. And if you want to actually simulate nature, you really have to make it quantum mechanical. It's a wonderful prob problem and it's really not very easy to do. Why it's not easy to do? Um, let's just get a little bit more uh, quantitative. Uh, everybody knows spins in this room, I think. Or almost everybody. We have some junior members as well. Uh, I'm referring to my son. <laughs> so, but I think he knows as well what a spin is. So there are 42, if you put 42 spins and you try to simulate them in a the computer, then you need, uh, in 2010, the Roadrunner, which was around uh, 2,000 tons and it consumed four megawatts of power, she could just about do it. Actually, just about write the state, the quantum state down and follow the the, the, all the coefficients, and then it would just, by just adding one more spin, it would just tell you that it's not enough. I need another room or another roadrunner. Now, seven years later, like uh, last month, um, on another kind of super beast like this one named Corey, I don't know where they get these names actually, but uh, this is 29 petaflops. This was 1.1 petaflops for the computer people in the room. Um, the important part is, uh, is that they managed to run 45. And, and really, it seems that it's really the borderline. We can't really do much more. Um, and there's a statement that by, by 50, basically, there's nothing we can, we can hope we could ever simulate. There's no classical machines that can do 50 spins. I mean, this gets a bit like this picture by, I don't know how many of you have seen this cartoon in the past. It was very popular in Greece in the 80s when I was growing up. The, it's, it's a Western kind of US made cartoon. The coyote chasing the roadrunner, the real roadrunner, which is a bird and runs very fast. I guess that's how they got the name of the roadrunner for the computer. And the coyote's kind of mission in life is to catch that roadrunner and basically eat him. 
Uh, he never makes it because the road run is very fast and very smart. The Coyote is somehow always slow and a little bit silly. But, uh, you know, if we want to make a parallel, uh, maybe this time, I mean, he always comes up with some uh, uh, interesting devices to catch the Roadrunner. Uh, if he uses quantum technology, maybe in this case, uh, it's, uh, he will get his bird. The question is only when. According to this guy and, uh, and, and, and many people in the, in the field, this is a matter of time. Um, some strong statements, I mean, John doesn't usually make strong statements, but this can be interpreted as a strong statement, is that by the end of the year, uh, we will have a quantum machine that can solve quantum supremacy. I do something um, quantum, it can be useless, and I will explain later what I mean by useless. Uh, I won't be like a, a quantum algorithm or a user for quantum computation, but it will be quantum, and it won't be able to be reproduced by, by a classical machine. What we do in our group is more on user for quantum computation and quantum simulation. Before I get to that, let me just quickly review where these kind of quantum machines are at the moment, these quantum simulators. Uh, in the Feynman perspective, where, where you use a system to, to mimic and, and simulate another physical system. Uh, at least half of the people in this room either work directly or, or study or do simulations on cold atom physics. Um, maybe the other half can be also categorized, or maybe one third, one third, in, in linear photonics and, and trapped ions. I think it is very active in these areas. Um, this technology can be used to do quantum simulation. Uh, we don't do it in this uh, center yet, at least on this kind of popular version. Uh, but um, uh, there have been works where linear rocks, for example, are excellent to do uh, topological physics, boson sampling. And now I'm using uh, maybe special terminology, but it's uh, maybe some people have heard about it. Ions are very good to do quantum magnetism and you know implement effective spin models. And superconducting circuits are again very popular these days to build both quantum computers and quantum simulators. I mean the usual the important problem here is that ideally we would like to go in this kind of two-dimensional diagram of controllability and scalability in this direction, but actually this is what we get most of the time. This is where we are. And the problem is that keeping quantum coherence, you know, um, keeping quantum states long enough, it's an issue for most of these technologies. Um, now I want to pause for a, for a minute and kind of clarify a general debate um, that, and also put my position into this. What's really a proper quantum simulation? So for example, I mean, these days, you know, you hear about quantum technologies. There's a lot of activity in Asia, in Europe, the flagship in US. Everybody wants to have a quantum technology machine or a quantum simulation of quantum computing. Specifically for the quantum simulator, what is a quantum simulation? It's, for example, just solving the Stradgear equation. It's, it's, it's a quantum equation in a, in a computer for the, the usual uh, I don't know, well potential a quantum simulation or driving an atom with a laser. Is that a quantum simulation? I mean, I have heard there are people in the field, I won't name them, that they say it is. I take, I take a kind of strong stance on this. And I, I, I don't think it is. And I'm not the only one. I think there are some kind of known people, at least to, to this room, that they, they have a, an equally strong view. And I will explain later what is a quantum simulation. I, and just to make a small joke, I chose pictures of Peter and Ignacio, which are particularly kind of mean looking, but they are not like this usually. Actually, they're nicer guys most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so what is a quantum simulation? Let's just define it once and for all and get it out of the way. Um, this is a many words slide. Bear with me for a minute, we'll just go through it together. Um, this is kind of stolen from Maciek. Um, 
So quantum simulator is really an experimental system that mimics a simple model of family of models of condensed matter, high energy physics, etc. That's a general first level definition, okay. But the simulated models have to be of some relevance for applications and our understanding of challenges of condensed matter, high energy physics, general quantum and body physics. Three, they have to be hard. Solving the Schrodinger equation in my laptop is not hard. Or driving an atom with a laser experimentally, I mean, it requires technology and, you know, it took us 50 years or something after the invention of quantum mechanics to do it, but it's not a quantum simulation. There are some exceptions when you actually really do physics that are not maybe computationally hard or complicated to do experimentally, i.e. outside of this many-body regime, but they are exotic. I will talk about examples later, like things that have been predicted, maybe high-energy physics, in relativistic physics, we cannot do the experiments because of we need an accelerator as big as the universe or the, I don't know, the, the, the solar system. Then if you build something, even if it's kind of linear looking physics, then, then maybe that qualifies for a uh, quantum simulator. And a quantum simulator should also allow for a broad control of parameters uh, of the model control preparation, manipulation, detection of states of the system. This sounds like the David Sengio criteria, but for quantum simulation. Uh, and it should allow for validation, because it's important, validation is important, very important aspect of quantum simulation. If I don't know what I'm simulating, I don't know the solution, how do I check that what I get is really the physics of the system or just rubbish of the experiment? And, okay, once we have this, let's say we have all this, and in the technologies I mentioned earlier, most of the works satisfy to some degree all these criteria. What do we do with them? What do we simulate? Um, I mean, you can simulate ground states. I mean, many body ground states are very interesting for many, many people from different perspectives. This is at zero temperature. You can do non-zero non temperature, again, statics, not time-dependent dynamics. You can do dynamics out of equilibrium. I will talk about this towards the end of the talk. And of course, you can do system reservoir, open system dissipative dynamics. Um, so this is, this is the end of chapter one. So let's see now how to, what this has to do with photons and quantum optics and, and what I want to call sometimes many body quantum nonlinear optics. So again, um, a simple kind of diagram. This is the interaction strength per photon, in, in, uh, and this is the photon number. If you, you know, go to a random atomic physics lab and you talk to people doing optics or quantum optics especially, they will tell you a lot about linear optics. They will tell you about classical nonlinear optics, which has been there for some time as well. There's applications in technology and industry as well. They will tell you they are struggling, or some of them managed to get into this, which is the photon, photon, quantum nonlinear optics. And if you tell them about this, they will tell you that you are maybe too optimistic. But this is really what I want you to talk, I'm, I'm talking about now. So from the experimental perspective, we are entering this area from the theory perspective. It's exciting, there's beautiful works, and I'll try to review a little bit about this. Um, so again, just a, f a slide on platforms where one can actually do this kind of quantum many nonlinear optics, or would hope we will do them soon with different degrees of success. Um, people have been doing some uh, semiconductor physics and polariton physics uh, for some time. There the interaction comes because the excitons strongly talk to each other and that, that, that creates effective polariton polariton interactions and you can simulate interesting semi-classical kind of models, not fully quantum correlated models. Nobody can do the Bose Hubbard model, for example, here yet, or a spin model or a quantum magnet. Uh, the whole point now, if you want to go to the, to use photons as, as the main player or polarities, you need to get them to interact strongly. Um, one way is to use Rydberg atoms. We, there is activity in CQT or get the atoms to talk strongly to some evanescent modes of a photonic crystal or actually um, 
get them to talk via this kind of superconducting approach where here you have microwave photons, you have effective, effective kind of, it's not exactly light in, in the usual sense, but can be seen as such. And this is the area I will focus more in the main part of the talk. Um, so just to summarize this part, photons do not talk to each other, just, they just go through each other. I mean, it's, um, they don't have mass, they don't have charge, they don't have volume, they, they, they don't have spin. We can do nonlinear optics in the usual kind of traditional sense, pump strongly nonlinear material with billions of, or trillions and trillions of photons, and then you can get some nonlinearity. And this is where, you know, uh, most of the nonlinear optics regime is, is, is concerned about. If you want to, quant to go to the quantum regime and really get the photons to, to talk to each other, you have to use a mediator. In this case, usually it's an atom. You put the atom in a cavity. What is a cavity? It's just two mirrors. The photons bounce back and forth. If they bounce back and forth for long times, compared to the time that they leak out, that kind of translates to what's called the strong coupling regime, where the atom-photon interaction is much larger than the cavity leakage and the spontaneous emission. When you get into this regime, then things get interesting. Um, let me explain what kind of interesting I mean. And this is one of the slides with equations. Um, so if we look at this case where we, we have this kind of very good mirrors and the, the photons bounce back and forth and the, every time they go through, they interact a little bit with the atom. If you put the atom in free space and you try to hit it with a photon, like the probability to get that is like almost zero. But here, because of this exactly this kind of basic physics effect, you get some interaction. If you want to describe that with a Hamiltonian, if you're a theorist, like a simple Hamiltonian that you, one can write is this James Cummings model that you have the photonic operator, the, 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 the bosonic operator describing the photon in the cavity, the resonator, this is like a quantum harmonic oscillator. You have the atom state, and then you have this interaction term, G times A, E, G. So the atom goes up, the photon goes down, basically. It's just absorbed or emitted. If you diagonalize this model, like in the theory style, and you write down the eigenstates, you see they have the structure that um, there's a ground state, which is no photons and atom in the, in the ground state. So the cavity is kind of empty and, and the atom is in the ground state. And then you have, you have this kind of doublets that they go up, depending to how many photons really you, you initially put in your system. You can think it in this sense. Uh, if you don't have this coupling, then it's just an empty cavity. It's proposed a linear system. You just have n photons. It's like a quantum harmonic oscillator. I can keep putting photons up and go to, to high levels. If I have the interaction and it's strong compared to the losses, as we discussed, as I just said earlier, then you try to do a similar experiment. I it's putting a photon in, then, then you have to look for this available leg energy eigenstate, which is at somewhere here, one photon minus G, this quantity. And the second photon, if you try to stick another photon in, you see there is a mismatch because of this kind of square root of here. So it kind of, it won't go through. It will, it will bounce off in a sense. It won't couple. Um, that's an effective, that was a beautiful experiment. I mean, theory of this was done some time ago. Experimentally, it was done 10 years ago, roughly. And, uh, you know, they, ca they actually saw this effect. So the question now is, that, that was 10 years ago, is can we use this kind of basic photon uh, blockade to do many body physics, to do stuff with photons that only electrons or atoms could do. I build like quantum simulators. I mean, it was a wild Star Trek type of <laughs> idea at the time. It slowly gets, as, as you will see in the next few slides, more and more interesting and more and more non-Star Trek. You need to have a lattice, first of all. How do you have a lattice of photons? You put many cavities together. Uh, couple cavities. Again, if you talk to an experimentalist that works with cavities, they will say this is, or it was very, very difficult, and it is difficult in the optical regime, but not so much in the microwave regime, as we saw later in the superconducting qubits. 
Now, then you put your atoms to provide the interactions. Then you use photon blockade as the nonlinearity, and then you have all the ingredients to do lattice models, like condensed matter models, basically. And that's what we kind of did 10 years ago. We just put this as a, as a theory, completely theory model, very simple Hamiltonian, the James Cummings lattice, or what's called now the James Cummings Hubble model. You have lots of cavities, lots of resonators. Each of them has one single two-level system, can be a real atom or a quantum dot or a, or a transmon, a superconducting qubit. And you know, at this level where theories, we didn't care. We just wrote a two-level, two levels, and that's an atom. Of course, in, in reality, things are more difficult. And then photons can hop from side to side. Now, through this evanescent coupling. If you look at this Hamiltonian now from this kind of many-body perspective and try to, to look for the ground state, for example. The ground state is kind of boring here because it just means atoms in the ground state and no photons, just G0, G0, G0. There is nothing interesting in that sense because photons do not have a chem chemical potential. Photons do not interact with, with a reservoir. I cannot really do the usual approach as in cold atoms, and now I assume a little bit of background in this cold atoms and both have a model that you, they have a chemical potential, and I put a lattice, and I can look at the ground state. So what, what are we looking at here then? We look at field states. So in this sense, I'm going to put photons in each of them, and then I'm going to look for the lowest. Let's say I have 100 cavities. I put 100 photons, one each, and I'm going to look for the properties of this lowest energy field state down here. This 1 minus, 1 minus, 1 minus. In the limit where I don't have any coupling, the ground state will be 1 minus, 1 minus, 1 minus. Right? And then I switch on the coupling, there should be some hopping. And in, you know, there should be some many-body dynamics. What kind of many-body dynamics? Can I, is there a phase transition, for example? Can I, is it like Bosch Hubbard like? Can I, can I use it to do, uh, to study phase transitions? And the answer is yes. And um, kind of the very first preliminary calculation done in a very small laptop, up to seven sites, looking at the total excitations per site. So this is how many photons you have and how many excitations you have in the atoms. I'm plotting the variance for that field state. As you now change what? Not the hopping, because they are not optical lattices. I cannot really take, an, unless it's some, some sort of jelly material, and uh, uh, to change the hopping. But I can change the nonlinearity. I can change the interaction, the strength. How do I do that? By detuning the atom of the cavity. If I do that, then this nice unharmonicity goes away, and I go to what's called the linear regime, or non-interacting regime. So what we brought in here was the detuning of the atom from the cavity. That can be done using an external field, depending on the implementation. Again, can be different. So in this regime, you are fully resonant. On the left, this is logarithmic. And on the right, you are off resonant. Um, you go to what's called the dispersive regime. And then you look at how the, the particle numbers fluctuate. If you have a mod state where you have 1, 1, 1, 1, let's say, for feeling fraction 1, it's, the population is locked and there is no fluctuations. So the variance should be 0. And as you go to the weakly interacting regime, what's called the superfluid state, you know, particles start hopping. Particles here are these quasi kind of excitations. It really depends on the terminology and the, back, you know, the angle you see it. In our case, it's just atom photon excitations in this uh, one plus minus states, photons and atomic excitation. And you see that as you change this, it really resembles a phase transition. It goes from one side to the other. Um, you can put dissipation with, within the strong coupling approximation. Do you see that it's still there? And kind of, it looks like a bosch hubbard type of thing. And in, indeed, if you do mean field theory on this, on this model, you know, the, what I just saw was numerics, but you can also do mean field theory. The user way we do it in bosch hubbard model, write this term as a decouple the, the hopping operators and, and calculate what's called the the, the mode lobes and the phase diagrams, you get something similar to Bosch-Hubbard, but you have an extra axis now. 
You have an extra axis, which is the detuning between the atom and the cavity, because these guys are not just bosons. Photons are the guys that hope, but there are atomic excitations, uh, atoms actually nailed in each of the cavities. And the total uh, thing, a polariton, you might want to call it, is the, 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 the one that really follows this kind of bose hubbard physics. OK, so this is more or less uh, the start of the story 10 years ago. Many works followed up later, you know, of you can do mode stage, you can do quantum computing, you can do spin models by using the atoms, the hyperfine states here, and you can do what's called Heisenberg spin magnets, XX plus YY and ZZ uh, terms. You can do uh, two dimensional structures and study gauge fields where the photos now hop around this two dimensional cavity array and they pick up a face, a non-trivial face, which relates to what's called uh, whole physics and fractional whole physics in condensed matter. I don't have time to go into detail on this, but what I only want to show is that, I mean, this, I'll, I try to remember to put in each of the slides what's theory, what's experiment, just to give a, a feeling where this field is. So this is theory, you know, like eight, nine years ago. There is an experiment on a, on a small, Lattice three points only here. There is a, this is like a, maybe five by five, the simulation. Uh, but the basic kind of uh, structure to do the gauge field has been implemented recently in this, in this work by, again, by the Google group. But the, the way they did the gauge field is slightly different than what we had here that was before superconducting qubits were. So popular, we were using atomic states and external lasers to map into this extra phase. Here they do it using what's called floquet or driven approach. You drive the qubits, and the way they, the dynamics evolve, you get an extra phase. And you can mimic this kind of effective magnetic field and, and, and chiral states, as they call, states that go around the, this uh, basic cell. And just uh, like two years ago, 2005 or so, it was nice to see that, you know, it's not that Star Trek uh, technology to couple cavities, at least in this kind of microwave regime. There was um, another experiment from the Princeton group of Andrew Hook, where they actually coupled 72 of these cavity atom systems in the original kind of, you know, theory proposal. Um, and, and what they studied here, they studied, they pumped light, this is one dimensional structure. You can pump, you put the signal in one side, and then you measure the output by controlling the strength of the interaction, and you see what's called, because this is an open system, a dissipative phase transition. You see it at the, at the strength of the signal at, as you scan through. It's kind of, it resembles to bistability physics that we know from nonlinear resonators and nonlinear uh, physics, for, can, you can see it in a single cavity, but this is a mendy body version. So that was encouraging that, you know, at least in the open regime, this can be done. And, and of course, this is not the only way to do strong correlated states of light. You can use, as I mentioned earlier, Rydberg atoms, and there have been interesting experiments where you exploiting the Rydberg interaction, you have a, this is a, your usual atomic interaction, then you have highly excited Rydberg states. These, these atoms are huge, and they have a, a massive dipole moment, and they interact strongly. So if you try to excite them and create polaritons here, light matter excitation, you see that they also the polaritons talk to each other. These basic experiments have been done with uh, two or three excitations. Being theorists, you know, we, Assume, let's, let's say that it works for more. The key point here is that you need to have, uh, you know, uh, optical depth. You need to have the right, the right interaction regimes. But um, what you could do, you could simulate kind of continuous models from condensed matter. The previous stuff was lattice models in this kind of setups, assuming the photons or the polaritons can strongly interact. These are go under what's called the Luttinger and Turing models. You can have, for example, two light fields entering the medium, this kind of a whole, hollow core uh, photonic fiber, 
or this is a tapet fiber that has atoms trapped, you send light through, they interact, you simulate a complicated condensed matter model, and then by um, the light that comes out, you measure the correlation functions and you reproduce the unknown model. This is theory. It has not been done experimentally yet. It's a challenge experiment, uh, but we hope somebody might do it at some point. What has been done in the experiment is, and this is one out of three experimental things I will mention. This is only briefly the last part. I will try to explain a little bit more. This is a linear model. This is the Dirac equation. So you have a spinner. This is the momentum term in one dimension. This is the mass, and this is the spinner again. This is called the, uh, if you can control the mass term, or in this kind of field theory picture, if this is, uh, this is what's called a solid on background, the details are not important. Imagine that it's just the mass that in one dimension behaves like this. It starts from minus m to plus m. So it's a, it's a specially dependent mass. In two dimensions, it looks like a vortex. In 3D, it looks like a, what's called a magnetic monopole. So these guys, Jackie and Rabi, have predicted that if you take this, this is a linear model, relativistic linear model, and, and you solve it, there is a zero, zero energy solution that you can write down like this. It's the integral of this guy. And it looks like, like this. It's a zero energy mode that sits in the middle of the, of the band and it's topologically protected. As long as the background, this kind of mass term, starts from minus and goes to plus m, it doesn't matter how it, it wiggles in the, in the middle, the zero energy mode is there and is robust and, 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 and protected. Now, what we did at some point was we gave up with the interacting models because it was very tough to do in this, or at least until recently, maybe there will be a breakthrough in technology as well, like in the lattices. And we tried to see whether we can implement this. And indeed, it's possible. And this is a work in collaboration, sorry for the resolution here, with some people in the US, where um, using slow light polaritons in room temperature, and this is important, we managed to implement this kind of spinner model. The spinner has two components. It's two different polaritons. And we actually managed to see signals of the zero energy mode. Um, I won't talk much more about this because I don't have time, but I'm happy to discuss with people in the audience if they're interested. Another experiment, which again, in collaboration with people in, uh, in photonics in, in, in Germany, in integrated photonics, was again, relativistic things. This is part of the, so let's put it this way. I am, it's linear models, but they won't a let's say piece of uh, either Peter Zoll or Ignacio Sirac because they are exotic. So we are not in the core of the quantum simulation, but it's, these are hard models and, and, and topological. So this one has topological aspects. This one has unphysical physics. So the Majorana equation. So this is Majorana. Uh, and this is Dirac. Majorana you know, has a very interesting life story. She you know, nobody knows what happened to him. Basically, was a brilliant Sicilian math uh, mathematician. Uh, he died very young or disappeared very young in a trip, in a, in a boat trip back to, to Italy, I think. But in the uh, few years that, you know, he was around, he managed to write down some very interesting um, uh, things. One of them was this, this equation. So she took Dirac's kind of approach and then, he just put on the, on the right-hand side the uh, uh, um, conjugation, a charge conjugation. So what does this mean? If this was a charged particle, this is its opposite. The, the original Dirac equation has, um, these are real fields, basically. If you, say, if you take them complex fields and you change the charge conjugation, this is a physical equation because it means that you do dynamics, you start with something which is positively charged and there is nothing else in the universe, it changes to negative charge and vice versa. So it breaks charge conservation. It's an unphysical equation. But nevertheless, he wrote it down. He's a mathematician. He said, let's, let's write it down. What does it mean? <laughs> so, or he was, yeah. So um, now the, the, the a disclaimer here, the real version, the real part of, of these guys, if they are real, spinners, and you quantize them, then you get Majorana fermions in the fully interacting uh, 
quantum regime. I'm not talking about Majorana fermions here, I'm talking about the first, at the first level, the first quantization level, the Dirac or the Majorana equation, the dynamics. So Majorana fermions is something different. I mean, it comes from this, but in the interacting regime. So the idea was, can we do this in physical physics somehow? How can we probe how would the universe look like if this was possible, if Chad's conservation was not uh, there? So, and um, we managed to figure out a way to do it. It's a kind of a very simple observation. We, you can actually write this weird guy we call Majoranon to differentiate it from the Majorana fermion. The Majorana is a solution of this equation. You can show that you can write it down as a superposition of normal real spinners, Majorana fermions or Majorana particles, if you want to call them, like this, with a superposition with an eye face, the positive mass and the negative mass. But these guys are Dirac particles. They obey, they are physical particles. You can write down a Dirac equation and, and simulate them in your computer or set up an ion trap or a photonic lattice. People have done both to implement the Dirac equation. So if you can do this and this simultaneously and put a face, then you will have this weird spinner that is charged, non-conserving, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and effectively, this is what we did. We did collaboration with uh, some guys in Germany in the, in the Institute of Optics in Jena. Now they moved to Rostock, Alexander Zamait. They fabricated a double lattice structure for us. And they created a positive charged Dirac particle where it actually propagates down. You can see the Zeta Bevengum here a little bit as it goes down. And the lower lattice structure has a negative charged particle. And the very simple way to do this eye phase is to do a beam splitter operation. So you bring the wave guys together, you look at the upper arm, and this is the major unknown, basically. So in a, in a kind of in a physical setup. It's a, it's a kind of a tricky, fun thing to do. You don't learn anything. You don't simulate a, a hardcore, many body Hamiltonian, but you, 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 you can run this in physical physics in a physical uh, setup. And of course, there are other works by many other people in this area. People have done topological states of light. Again, this is linear resonators in the microwave regime that you can send the light, at, and you can see that if you have disorder or noise, it doesn't really scatter back, but it continues and goes along. It gets topologically protected. You can do floquet topological insulators in these waveguides. Again, these fusilli or macaroni waveguides, as I like to call them. They look like macaroni that go into the, to the glass. And you can send light through, and you can, again, see some interest topological physics here. Um, so to so summarize this first part, uh, so you can use interacting photons to, to do several kind of interesting things. The larger less scales compared to cold atoms allow you for efficient preparation and detection. Single site addressing is by default possible. You can detect the light that comes out and you can measure the atomic states, sorry, the, the many body states easier. And you can also do driven dissipative. And this is really the important stuff because it's an open system. So naturally, you can do driven dissipative out of equilibrium physics. But I will not talk about this, because after <laughs> quite uh, some, you know, some time, we managed to do very interesting closed system physics here in the superconducting chip of Google. So I will talk the last part, the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, um, how to, you can use the systems to do physics beyond the ground state, beyond quantum phase transitions, and how can you, for example, probe what's called many body localization? OK, so how many of us have, uh, have heard about many body localization before? One, two, OK, a few. Half of them are in my group. <laughs> okay. Uh, OK, so that's good, because I also don't know very much about it. It's a condensed matter concept. But uh, let's just try to go through it carefully. So you have uh, quantum systems, many-body quantum systems. If they are closed, if I get a many-body quantum system and there's nothing else around it, Schrodinger equation, quantum information, tells us that it would just evolve unitarily to something else. 
and whatever you start, it will have all the memory all the way to the, to the end, right? There is, if there is no reservoir. So the question is, if a system is very big, does it actually thermalize or not? According to quantum mechanics, it's not thermalize. But if I take a big system and I look at the subsystem, um, and I trace out the rest of, of uh, the degrees of freedom, will that subsystem of the larger system be in a thermal state? I mean, all these questions connect to each other, thermalization, many body localization. We know what's going on in the classical re, um, realm and semi-classical physics. We know how to talk about chaotic, ergodic, and thermal states. This is a, just a, some sort of billiard that bounces around. In the case that it covers every single space, every single point in this space, we say that the system is ergodic. If you have some sort of situation that you, you know, the boundary here is such that you know, all, the, all the trajectories stay in this kind of torus and something is left out. This is what's called breakdown of ergodicity in classical systems. But what does this, how do you extend these concepts in the quantum regime? How do you tell whether a quantum system, a many body quantum system is ergodic or not? Will it thermalize or not? Um, and because basically uh, um, you don't have this kind of tools as before. So, so the question basically is, can they thermalize by themselves in its own dynamics? In the sense that I divide the whole system into two areas, I calculate the density matrix, I'll try to make it quantitative now, for rho alpha, and I look whether this is some sort of thermal state or not. So when does this hold and when does it break? What kind of systems? Can we make a general theory? This is a, this is a very hard problem, especially in the interacting regime. Anderson was one of the uh, pioneers that discussed the problem for the non-interacting regime in the, what's called Anderson localization. I will mention it a little bit later. For the general case, this is a very difficult question. Um, so why is it a difficult question? Because you really have to look at every single eigenstate. This is beyond the ground state. This is not just ground state physics. So if it's very tough to do a mod to superfluid transition in the lab or in the theory, this is harder because you don't have just one state. You have to follow every, every single eigenstate and see whether they spread or not. So let me make it a little bit more, uh, visualize it a little more. So Anderson, uh, what, what he, he, he stated is that if the disorder, if you have a lattice and it's disordered enough, at some point, and she proved that, states localize. If you have small disorder, you have extended states. Um, so uh, one can actually answer this question for the non-interacting case. If you put small interactions, and this is work recently, like by, by famous people like Achuller and, and others, you can also do a little bit of perturbation theory and also some numerics and so that for other some type of system with a weak interaction, then again, you can, uh, you can see that this um, localization, the Anderson localization persists. But what happens when the disorder is comparable to the interaction? I mean, this is, this is the hard part. You cannot do perturbation theory. Numerics are very hard because you don't have any specific model. I mean. You can be spin models, both Hubble models, can be anything. Uh, and, and the best you can do with numerics, when you have to keep track of all the states, is like in Roadrunner type of computers, like 20 sites or 30 sites. You can't really make conclusive uh, uh, statements. So, and of course, this is, uh, it has implications in quantum information as well, because in one case, in this kind of thermalized state where states are, are extended and you get into this delocalized regime, you calculate entanglement, it scales with the volume, or in the other case, it with the area, and there is a lot of quantum entanglement type of approaches in this as well from the more quantum formation perspective. Can I do a quantum memory from this? For example, if, we're, if, if, if I am in the many body localized phase and I start with an initial state, and later on the system somehow has memory of that, then I have a, quantum, a very good quantum computer, a quantum memory, right, that is not lost. So it has implications in different fields. Um, 
So this is basically, again, the same thing I just discussed. So this gray area is really where uh, a lot of activity recently is, is, is done. And uh, this is where we, uh, we also kind of enter a little bit with this recent work. So before I, may, I, I describe our, our recent work, there has been works in cold atoms and, and, and ions with the usual suspects, Emmanuel Bloch and Chris Monroe, which they try to probe the same kind of question in the cold atom sense with in, the, in, the, in the Bloch experiment. They start with a state. They start with a two-dimensional lattice. They put all the atoms in half of the lattice, and then they see how they spread. Does it actually spread in the, in the way that it uh, it's, it's thermalizes? Can, um, they calculated this population imbalance between left and right, and they, they, they compared that to what the theory would do for this kind of two-dimensional Bosch Hubbard like of model, and they probed some signatures of that, but they did not probe the eigenstates. They did not probe the original kind of theory thing, really look at every single eigenstate and check whether it's localized or extended. This is kind of an indirect way. And trap ions did a similar thing, um, starting with a kind of a spin model, a very specific case, and they again had an indirect approach on this kind of problem. Um, what we did here, we, we claim we do the full thing, full Monty type of stuff, but again, it's a finite size system, but we do see for the first time the full eigenstates and we follow every single, um, we follow the full dynamics. So let me explain how that can be done. Imagine you have, this is the Google, the kind of old chip, there is a 15, one five qubit chip already made. Also, it later is unpublished. This is the published version. They've done a few things. It's nine sites. These are qubits. Qubits, I mean, qubits is the language that most of us are familiar with. Now I want to change that. Forget about qubits. The way they are really constructed, they are unharmonic oscillators from my perspective. And they, are, they really uh, hold, you know, uh, photon-like photo microwave kind of type of excitation. So I can write my nice and familiar both have models here. So I write this, this kind of nine side as a sum of oscillators. There's a nonlinear term, which is attractive. They usually, the, the Google guides operate this when U is very large. So you only have two states. You have a spin, a qubit, and you have a hopping. What we told them is, why don't you try to make this small, comparable to J as much as you can because of the fabrication things. And then you can actually check this kind of uh, transition, basically. That's kind of the summary of the story. There is a, there is a small hunch here that the, the, the potential is quasi-periodic because, again, as in the Anderson case for ra randomness, there is theory for similar theory that says that quasi-periodic potentials without interaction also have localized states. So how to do that? For, for, so for this thing, we had to develop or we adapted a novel spectroscopy method to follow all the eigenstates based on quantum dynamics. And, and this is so, so the work has two aspects. There is this the, 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 the method and then, and then how we do the MBL. Now, usually spectroscopy, for all experimentalists, I guess, in the audience, if I want to probe the energy of a system, especially in, in, in photonics, I send some light, I see what comes out, and I see the peaks. That tells me that where the eigen energies are, roughly, right? Now, if I have very, very, um, a very coherent system, very long coherent times, dissipation is more, very closed system, then I, I can have a kind of a uh, uh, mechanical analog that I poke the system and I see how it vibrates and I get all the possible vibration modes, all the, uh, all the eigen modes. Uh, how, do, how do we poke things? And we have to actually follow the quantum mechanical uh, laws of evolution is as follows. So if you have a, a lattice and you want to find all the possible quantum vibration modes, I'm talking about phonons here, I'm just, just hopping things. I, if I put some bosons, in this case photons, that are don't in a, they don't belong in an eigenstate, let's say site 1, 1, and a site 2, 2, then it will start hopping around, right? If I can make a measurement later on, 
I can actually learn, I can, I can get the spectrum from that. And I'll explain how. It's actually, it was there all the time. It's not completely novel in the sense, I mean, if somebody's, after we developed this, we thought like, but this is just quantum mechanics. I mean, we knew this like 50 years ago. Why they wouldn't explore it? I mean, we didn't explore it because following this kind of time evolution for observables, you really need to have a very quantum coherent system. If you have a little bit of loss, this method does not work. And I'll explain why. So let's just do a very simple example of a double, double well. Let's say we want to plot the energy eigenstates of this double well dynamically in time. So you have something that hops from one side to the other. You have the individual energies and the hopping. Now, if you put one particle on the left and nothing on the right or vice versa, and then you let it evolve, and you look, for example, the expectation value of population in, in the left, then by just doing, you know, first year undergraduate quantum mechanics exercise, you see that the population oscillates as, the, as a function of the energy difference, E plus and uh, E minus, which are the eigenstates here. If you try to calculate this, it gives you zero, just because of the way this expectation value is, is for this closed system calculated. If you put an entangled state of this form, you get something like this for the uh, expectation value. You get, again, oscillations like this. But if you calculate this operator, you get the absolute eigenenergies. So very simply, if I can ob observe this, this time evolution and I do a Fourier transform, I get E plus and E minus. I get the states. This is a simple toy model, of course. But it illustrates <coughs> the method. So if I Fourier transform this, I just get two states the two eigenstates. Can I extend this in a, in a lattice, in a many-body system? Can I get the eigenstates dynamically like this, assuming that the lattice is coherent long enough? And this is a key point, because eventually the distance between the states, my resolution will be decided by the coherence time of the system. So this is the cuts. If I want to go to the thermodynamic limit, the levels become too close, then it doesn't work. But we don't live in a thermodynamic limit world, right? We live in a, we do real experiments with finite size systems. And that's exactly what we did. Um, the protocol is kind of simple, very, very simple. You have one to nine sites. You put one of the sites in a superposition, and then you measure this kind of quadratures, A dagger plus A, A dagger minus A. And as a function of time, you do the Fourier transform, and you repeat the experiment for different ends. So you put the first experiment, you put one particle in the first side. You let it evolve, let's say you measure there. Then you do another one with the second one, third one, and so on. And if you do that, and, and you look, so when you calculate the expectation values, you get this kind of oscillations, right, which are kind of superpositions of different waves. If you forget us from this, let's say for the first qubit, second qubit, third qubit, fourth qubit, nine qubits, and, and then you look at the Fourier amplitude. The Fourier amplitude is nothing else than the, the, the projection of the eigenstate to the initial state. So I, I poke the eigenstates. I'm poking the system this way. By looking at the height, I get the amplitude. By looking at the position, I get the state. I do the same for the second one, third one, and so on. And then I sum them up, and I get something like this. So this is nine sites. And if you calculate here one particle, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine peaks. These are the nine corresponding single particle eigenstates in the lattice. How far they are apart, of course, if my resolution, if my system was decohered after some time t, which is inversely proportional one over that time compared to this, then I, then I will miss some states. So really, you have to have a coherent system coherent enough compared to this minimal distance. And that's basically the method. You can do that by one particle, you get the single particle states. If you put two particles, you get the two particle states, and so on, and then you can get all the spectrum. And that's exactly what these guys did. We benchmarked this to see whether it makes sense and whether we can actually do something useful out of this, except that this is a lattice model. We calculated what's called the one-dimensional Harper model, which is basically maps to the two-dimensional quantum hole effect, and you get this nice butterfly physics. The butterfly is a very famous kind of, again, picture and physics um, uh, concept. 
This is the head of the butterfly. What is this? The eigenenergies and the function of the magnetic field for a two-dimensional lattice of electrons. I have a magnetic field, and I calculate the eigen spectrum. This is how it looks like as a function of the magnetic field. Can we make a butterfly out of this method just to benchmark it? And uh, with nine sites, if you put 100 sites, it looks a very nice butterfly. It really looks like a butterfly. You see the head, the tail. and Now, if you put nine sites, theory gives you this. I mean, it's a kind of a zombie butterfly, but it is a butterfly. <laughs> okay. Um, now, this is actually from the theoretical prediction. If you just run the nine sites, the corresponding Hamiltonian. If you run our method, this kind of Fourier method with the dynamics, you get something like this. Actually, it looks more on the butterfly here, but we play with the background a little bit to make it look nicer. So again, this is, this is the Fourier amplitude of the corresponding eigenstates, and this is how it looks as a function of the magnetic field. That's theory, according to our, our kind of method. The guys want to measure it, and they get this, which is actually very similar, and this is actually the error, how far the experiment from, from the theory in megahertz, and you see that most of the peaks are quite low in error. We miss some, some, some energy eigenstates here, but that's because of some, some uh, issues with uh, calibration, and et cetera, with the experiment. So the method works, at least for kind of non-trivial uh, one-dimensional linear systems. Can we do like the, and this is the last chapter, let it just take five minutes of your time, maybe three. Can we do interacting models with this? Can we attack the beast? Like, like really do the, the, the hard stuff, get all the energy eigen levels, and really all in the sense that see signatures of this many body localization. And um, again, we run the same protocol with this kind of spectroscopy method. Now we put two particles, one in the first side, another in the, say, side five, and then you, you change this and you run the experiments. You calculate this expectation value, which looks like XX and YY operators. They are very related, not exactly those. Then you do the Fourier transform. You take your quasi-periodic Hamiltonian, which we know from the theory it has, for the non-interacting regime, it has localized states. We put the interactions there, and we try to check whether we have ergodic phase or many-body localized phase. And one way to, to do that operationally is to go and look at the eigenstates, as I said, and look how the levels really distribute themselves. The theory says that in the ergodic phase, you, they should follow what's called the Poisson Gaussian, sorry, uh, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, and in the MBL case, you, they follow a Poisson distribution, the way the levels are distributed. So this is something we can actually extract because we have the eigenstates, so we can make these plots. And that's what, what, what we did. Now, this is a two-dimensional plot. This is disorder. As disorder increases, you go to this, uh, to this uh, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. This is the, the sorry, the other way around. The localized phase is when disorder is large. So you go to Poisson. Disorder is small. Compared to the hopping, you have this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So this is disorder, and this is the corresponding level separation defined as the minimum between the distance, the consecutive distance by the max. Then you run this dynamically, you extract the eigenstates, and if you see, as you plot this for, for uh, there is a transition here, so from this, you, you have some sort of Poisson distribution, and as you go up, there is this, this bump here. It's easier to see if you take a cut, let's take a cut at, at one and five, so one and five, low, low disorder, large disorder. So how does this look like? So the solid, sorry, the dashed line is for infinite disorder. La delta is very large. We have the Poisson distribution. We have localized state. They should behave like this, the levels, the eigenenergies. Um, the other case is this. This is when the levels repel each other and you have this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. That's the theory. That's the thermodynamic limit theory. And this is the experiment. I mean, depends your perspective, but I mean, they fit very well. <laughs> so this is the, what we measured for, for this 
delta j equals 1, small disorder, and this is the large disorder case. This point and this point is the problematic ones, otherwise it, it does look like a Poisson. But this has to do with actually that we have a finite system and what we, what we see is that probably the localization length hits the size of the system, so confuses things. But that's, uh, apart from that, you can see the transition. To, to, to check this a bit more, but I need to finish, uh, we did what's called the, the participation ratio, which is how many eigenstates, how many energy eigenstates are present in each lattice site. So if I put a particle in the first site, how much overlap it has with the other eigenstates. So that will tell me whether I'm extended or localized, right? And the same question can be asked, asked in the opposite regime. How many lattice sites each energy eigenstate spreads through? And if you calculate this kind of quantities, which they really have to do with the structure of the eigenstates, you see this kind of transition from a localized, so as, as the delta increases, sorry, from, a, from a, as you go up here, this is the localized regime, and, and delta is small, to, to uh, extend it to the localized transition. And you see it here as well, actually. So this is what's called also a two-particle, two-photomobility edge in the... And if, of course, there is some uh, fine detunings, like what happens if you miss levels, how, how accurate is this, but I don't want to bore you with the fine details. It works. Um, and I will s close with this. I hope I kind of gave you a kind of a fast forward version of the story. What, how can actually think about many body physics with photons? How can you do more transitions? Very briefly, I just mentioned this whole effect physics and the interacting models. I explained a little bit on the many body localization. This is uh, recent work. What we would like to do in the future, we would like to explore the boundary between interaction topology and disorder in general. Where does this, uh, I mean, there is a lot of physics in this boundary between these th three things. Many, many uh, famous effects actually have to do with this, uh, the interplay between the three. What happens if you have time dependent driving? And hopefully what we get from our proposals to test them in this kind of larger sites as well, and also continue working on this photonic ships and slow light. And I finish with a kind of a, how we would like to envision this thing. You have like a quantum simulator that you can actually tune every single thing and then have, a, have your fully controllable model. And I would like to thank the team our group here and, and, and uh, people that have left the group recently moved for other uh, places and specifically for this project. Uh, special thanks to Jiravat and Victor and, of, and the, the guys that did the experiment. Thank you.